hi, hi, hi. Welcome to the 2021 Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival. My name is Amparo Ortiz. I'm the author of Blaze Wrath Games, Dragon Blood Ring, and a contributor in the upcoming anthology, Marlo's Voices Comunidades Number no. One. It's my pleasure to serve as moderator for this panel, which is titled Add a Little Bit of Magic Fantastical Latinx Stories in Young Adult Literature. To everyone watching, thank you so much for tuning in. Please make sure to check out our anti harassment policy in the chat box. I'm thrilled to introduce the legends I get to call my co panelists today and I'll be letting them talk a little bit about their remarkable books. So first up, Romina Garber. Hi, Romina. <laughs> Romina Garber is a New York Times and international bestselling author whose books include Lobisona, its sequel, Casadora, and the Zodiac series. Born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and raised in Miami, Florida, Romina landed her first writing gig as a teen, called She Wrote, a weekly Sunday column for the Miami Herald, that was later picked up for national syndication. And she hasn't stopped writing since, and we're very grateful for that. She is a graduate of Harvard College and a Virgo to the core. <laughs> what can you tell us about Casadora, Romina? And also, hello again. Hi, Amparo. I don't hello. think about Blaze Wrath games. Like, it's every, I'm like, do you like dragons? And who says no to that question? So <laughs> the next thing is like, do you like hot pink books? And who says no to that That's question? a better question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'm kind of fangirling to be here with you. Um, but so my, uh, thank you for that beautiful introduction. My, my duology is Lobisona uh, and Casadora, which just released. And I have to show off this art because it's I'm beautiful. upset. The, the art is gorgeous. Um, and I feel so lucky to have this kind of art adorning Manu's story. Uh, so the series, just in brief, is about Manu who is an undocumented immigrant from Argentina growing up and hiding in Miami because she's undocumented, but also because her eyes would draw too much attention. And um, when her mom is arrested by ICE, Manu's left alone in the world, so she follows clues to find out who her criminal father was and why they're on the run from his powerful family. And she discovers a world ripped from Argentine mythology um, in the Everglades, of course where um, girls are all burujas and boys are all lobisones, but Manu does not fit into any existing binary system uh, allowed for her. And so she has to kind of figure out where she can belong. And Casadora is more about that. So if lobisona is about Manu figuring out um, who she is and where she belongs, um, Casadora is more about the world figuring out if there's room for Manu. And it takes place entirely in Argentina. So it's a very, very personal, and I'm very happy to share it. Yes, I'm very happy that you decided to share it. So thank <laughs> you very much for that. You're very kind. <laughs> Up next, Francesca Flores is a writer, traveler, and linguist. Raised in Pittsburgh, she read every fantasy book she could get her hands on and started writing her own stories at a young age. She began writing Diamond City while working as a corporate travel manager, as one does, when she's not writing or reading, Francesca enjoys traveling, dancing ballet and jazz, practicing trapeze and contortion, and visiting parks and trails around San Francisco, where she currently resides. Tell us about Shadow City in your own words, Francesca, and also hello. Hi, it's so nice to be here. I'm so excited to see you all. It's been so long since hanging out with other authors, even you know virtually. But these are my two books. Shadow City is the... Shadow City is the sequel. <laughs> it came out earlier this year. And the duology is about an assassin. And she, um, so she goes on a job to, you know, take out this billionaire, but she fails. And while she's trying to fix this mistake, she uncovers this conspiracy in her city. And then she and her friends are trying to stop it and you know she she kind of has to like become a good person so <laughs> that was a lot of so fun difficult. to write <laughs> so difficult to do <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you're an assassin <laughs> but we love her for it yes <laughs> all right so up next Maya Motain decided to be a writer when she was four years old and hasn't stopped writing since her first novel Nocturna was a Los Angeles Times bestseller as well as a number one Sunday Times bestseller Maya lives in New York City, where she pursues her passions of petting as many dogs as possible and buying purses based on whether they can fit a big book in them. 
Oculta is her second novel. Tell us a little bit about Oculta, Maya, and hello. And also, nice to meet you. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> nice to meet you too. Um, and I have to show my cover too. Yes, you should. It's shiny. Oh <laughs> yes, it um, is very shiny and we're very grateful. <laughs> yes, um, basically I wanted to make my like Afro-Latino reverse Aladdin dreams come true when it came to this book. And I wanted to let the female character be rough around the edges thief and the male character to be this sheltered kind of prince. So basically it's about a prince and a thief who have to team up to stop this dark magic from, um, from taking over the world. And that's mostly number one. And number two is about uh, the colonizing kingdom that once colonized Castellan, which is the kingdom of this book. Basically this world's England or Spain um, wants to make peace with them. So it's about the political drama of, of um, them coming together, of dealing with white supremacy, of dealing with all that in the Latino community. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot, but it, it's my, my dream book. And um, I have the next one coming out next year, hopefully in September. Um, but yeah, that's, that's Nocturna and Oculta. <laughs> Yay! Well, thank you for joining us. We're very excited, especially me, because I'm, like I said, I'm meeting you for the first time. <laughs> All right, so up next, Aidan Thomas is a trans Latinx New York Times bestselling author of young adult novels. They received an MFA in creative writing from Mills College originally from Oakland, California. They now make their home in Portland, Oregon. Aiden is notorious for not being able to guess the endings of books and movies and organizes their bookshelves by color. What can you tell us about Lost in Neverwoods, Aiden? Yeah, so I'm Aiden Thomas. Um, my two books are Lost in Neverwoods and Cemetery Boys. Um, and uh, Lost in Neverwoods is a kind of dark, twisted reimagining of Peter Pan is what I call it. And it's a contemporary setting in a little coastal town in uh, North Oregon called uh, Astoria, which I think I just said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's when Wendy was younger, she and her brothers went missing in the woods behind their house. And um, six months later, Wendy was found, but her brothers never the fur were. And the book takes place on the night of Wendy's 18th birthday, where kids in her small town are starting to go missing again and everyone's kind of wondering if Wendy and her brothers have something to do with it. And she runs into a boy who claims to be Peter Pan, who is a fictional character from stories her mom used to tell her. And he claims to know where her brothers are, where their missing kids are, and how to get them back if she can help him find his shadow. And then their cemetery boys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is um, <laughs> my heart book. And it is about a trans Brujo named Yadriel, who is trying to prove to his very traditional community of Brujex that he's a true Brujo. And he decides the best way to do that is to summon the ghost of his recently uh, deceased cousin. But he ends up summoning the ghost of Julian Diaz, the local bad boy at his high school. And so the two of them begrudgingly enter a truce in order to figure out what happened to Yadriel's cousin and also what happened to Julian. Excellent. I love that we have the book of your heart, the book of Maya dreams. Like this is already making me very emotional. I love it. All right. <laughs> so last but definitely not least, we have Laura Pohl. She is a YA science fiction and fantasy author. Her debut novel, The Last Eight, won the International Latino Book Awards. Her next series starts with The Grim Rose Girls. She likes writing messages in caps lock, never using autocorrect, and obsessing about Star Wars. When not taking pictures of her dog, she can be found curled up with a fantasy or science fiction book or replaying Dragon Age. Her favorite Disney princess is Cinderella, and her favorite Disney prince is Kylo Ren. A Brazilian at heart and soul, she makes her home in Sao Paulo. Can you give us a brief overview of the Grimrose Girls, Laura? Um, Abby, you're muted, but I think Laura yes, had you're a muted. <laughs> Some tech. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll just wait for her to come back on and then you can just prompt her and she'll, or it's fine. I'll prompt her like that, like this. I'll yeah, just like, no, no, go. no. If you <laughs> give her her last line or whatever. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought my internet was going to be faulty. So if it's kind of weird at some point, I apologize in advance. No worries. It's all fine. We're all working with what we got. <laughs> By the way, those intros were spectacular, everyone. 
Very emotional. You made me very emotional. And history repeats itself. Um, we'll wait a few more minutes and then uh, we might just roll in. To, if she's you know, still having trouble, we might just roll in and then if she comes back, we can add her in, if that makes sense, between questions at a natural point. <laughs> okay, so I'll give her another few minutes and then I'll come back on and let you know. Hey! Guys, woo, you can hear me. Wow. Yes. Yes. Well, my <laughs> internet, but I'm getting it from my phone, which hopefully holds off until like it decides to return or something. So, sorry, it was just like immediately as soon as I started the panel. No worries, <laughs> it happens. Okay, so I'm gonna take myself off. I'm gonna put you back in the order that you were in before, um, and then I'll let you know. Thanks okay. so much, Abby. Sorry. Oh, of course. No, no <laughs> worries. It happens. Okay. So as soon as I take myself off, if you want to just um, say the last few lines of your intro. And yes. then okay. I will reintroduce Laura. Gladly. Her favorite Disney princess is Cinderella, and her favorite Disney prince is Kylo Ren, a Brazilian at heart and soul. She makes her home in Sao Paulo. Can you give us a brief overview of the Grim Rose Girls, Laura? Hey, everyone. Very happy to be here. Um, the Grim Rose Girls, which is over here, but also here, which also, like so many people on this planet, has a gorgeous cover, which I have to keep showing to everybody, obviously. Uh, the Grimmers Girls is a story set in a boarding school in Switzerland. It's about four. Fate is somehow connected to like the dark version of fairy tales. And if they don't find a way to break this curse, uh, they're going to succumb next. So with has a little bit of both and I had a lot of fun playing with 
both things, both retellings and just, you know, the overall premise of where All right, thank you so much, Laura. Let's get into the first question, shall we? Shall I continue to bother you? Yes, amazing, here we go. All right, whether it's the chosen one, an older mentor to help them on their quest, or the dark overlord trying to stop them, we're all familiar with fantasy tropes in Eurocentric settings. How do you choose which tropes to keep in your stories versus which ones to reimagine? Francesca, you, would you like to go first? Sure. The only idea I had when I first started writing it was vampire Rapunzel in a creepy forest. I wanted vampires, I wanted a Rapunzel retelling, and I wanted there to be a creepy forest. So that's what I started with. <laughs> and the trope, like the most recognizable trope, I guess, that's in there is the enemies to lovers one. And so I picked that because I really like reading and writing it. Um, I, I think one of the main things for me to decide what trope to use is whether it's something I enjoy because otherwise readers can kind of tell that it's forced. Like I'm not good at writing love triangles, so I try to avoid those. <laughs> so even though it's a, it's a fun trope and sometimes I like reading love triangle stuff, but I can't write it. So I veer away. But when I picked the enemies to lovers thing, that's a relationship specific trope. And so I think that helped me frame the whole story. It um, sort of structure the plot around that journey of the relationship and help the book stay released. So that really structure the whole story. I love that you said that it's something that you know you're familiar with, what you're good at or what you would like to excel at on the page versus what you're not too sure you're going to actually do well. And I wonder if that's also something you consider, Romina, when you're thinking about what should I keep and what should I reimagine? Do you think about your strengths at all or just your interests? Absolutely. Absolutely think about my strengths. I mean, I do like to think about interests. You know, I do like to think, you know, we don't just write what we know, but we write what we want to know, but only if it's done responsibly, um, you know. Uh, and, you know, we are not monolithic. So just because I wrote about an undocumented immigrant from Argentina doesn't mean this is the story about the undocumented immigrant from Argentina. And that's so important. And that's how we get at that, you know. Um, so the trope, I guess the trope I would say was the magic school trope, you know, the, um, and uh, that was very important for me because I struggled a lot with um, a sense of home my whole life. Um, I still do. And Hogwarts was really the first place that I felt, oh my God, there's a place for me, except no one spoke Spanish and no one was, at the, and so uh, it was a little hard because I wanted to belong there so badly, but I didn't know if I could. Uh, and even like, you know, there's a, there's a scene in the early chapters of Obisona where Manu wants her mom to read Harry and she's like, name one Latino character and I'll read it. And that was kind of my mom's attitude too, you know, so I wanted to put that in there and I wanted to create the, the magic school I wanted, you know, the one where, you know, obviously there's still a lot of issues because there has to be, it can't be you go escape into magic and it solves everything on the contrary, you know, but, um, but yeah, I, I wanted it to be, you know, we drink mate in the morning. We have a lot of dulce de leche. Somehow nobody puts on weight. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but yes, all the foods. The foods is the most important thing. And the Spanglish, you know, being able to just unabashedly include Spanglish and not think twice about it. And of course, I got a lot of hate for that, but I got just as much love for that. So I'll take the love any day over the hate. Well said. And also very true. <laughs> Maya, how do you decide what is worth keeping and what is for you to play with? Um, I feel like I agree with pretty much everyone. Uh, you have to do what you like. So I love Thief Royal. I love that stuff. Um, and it reaches a point, at least as a person of color, sometimes it feels like if you write a fantasy novel or any novel and it uses regular tropes, someone's like, this is supposed to be diverse, but it's the same as everything else. And it's like, well, why, why can't people of color or other marginalized groups write about a love triangle or um, a thief and a prince? Like we should be able to do whatever is fun for us. And you can definitely 
feel it when it's forced. Um, I forgot who said it was Francesco or Romina, but like I used to work in publishing. Um, I used to be an editorial assistant at Random House. So I would get manuscripts all the time and be like, oh, everybody's writing vampires right now because, <laughs> because that's the trend and you can feel, they didn't really want to write about vampires, but, <laughs> but they know it's the trend. You can feel that inauthenticity. So if you want to write about love triangles with vampires and that sounds like the most basic thing ever, but you want to do it and you, you're going to make it fun, you're going to make it yours, you're going to make it Latino or whatever culture that you come from, do it. So when I came down to it, I was like, this is what I like. I'm going to write it. Someone else out there is going to like it. And we all have right. People from marginalized groups shouldn't be asked to reinvent the wheel when they're writing books. We don't have to like step away from these tried and true tropes. We should be able to use them too and remix them if we want. Um, so it's like everyone else, whatever I like, whatever draws me, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I could not agree more. And I feel like there is a huge pressure, I wanna say on specifically fantasy, anything speculative. It feels like, oh, it's been done before. Why am I speaking in that voice? I'm sorry. Oh, it's been done before. Like, why are you doing this again? You know, why? Well, because we don't see ourselves in these narratives that you have popularized for other people. So yeah, I agree. <laughs> Aiden, what do you choose to reimagine versus what you wish to keep? Let me unmute myself. I was like ready to launch in. Um, I think for me, it, it kind of always starts with the trope, right? And then your ideas kind of spiral out from there. And I think um, for Lost in the Neverwoods, which, you know, Peter Pan is a very a quintessential European fantasy, I would even say. And um, how this like never wanting to grow up is so romanticized. And I was like, but let's unpack the trauma around that. Like, what does that mean? What does it mean to um, be someone who doesn't want to grow up, who is trying to like grip onto their childhood and then the kind of inverse side of it. So what Wendy's going through, what does it mean when you've been forced to grow up too fast? You know, when she was 13, a really horrible traumatic thing happened to her. And because of that, her parents have become unable to take care of her. And so she kind of turns into that caregiver. So when the original canon of Peter Pan is really dealing about, you know, running away from your, um, your responsibilities and having a good time, this is about, okay, let's bring it back down to earth. And what does it mean when you suddenly have all these responsibilities um, thrust onto you? And how does that affect, you know, a teenager who's trying to, you know, move through the world while also dealing with all this other um, trauma? I'm just gonna keep using that word um, going on in their lives. And um, for Cemetery Boys, it was like very easy. I was like, oh, spooky, yes, love ghost stories, but like, let's make the ghost really cute and use the forced proximity trope. What's, yeah that that's what spoke to me on a very <laughs> personal level and then um like obviously if I'm going to write about ghosts it was very clear to me that I was going to write about you know my favorite holiday in the entire world which is Dia de Muertos and um so it was really fun to kind of use that almost as the base for my magic system and uh yeah that's that was really fun <laughs> I mean, that's one thing I can say about everybody here. You can tell that everyone had fun while they were working. I mean, jobs are not supposed to be fun, but if they are, you're doing the right job or you're you're in the right track, on the right track. Can't even English anymore. Laura, how do you choose what to reimagine and what to keep? And especially Aiden and you have like these very popular figures, I would say, in literature. That's mostly centered around European characters. What is that like? What do you um, choose? I feel like um like I maybe we're always fed. Uh I mean automatically because of imperialism, how we grow up, etc. Like everything that is fed to us with fairy tales, it's usually not just our own thing. Like we import a lot of culture. So uh I grew up in Brazil and we still had like all the Disney movies. Every time a Disney movie came out, we're all like, yes, let's go to the theaters and it was like always this big event, even when it's like imported and it's not even your own. Uh, but so the idea that I had was just that I have always wanted to make something like, what would I do with these things? And it's not that far away from like the originals, I would say, but um, like with all retellings and all, every time you try to reimagine a trope and every time you would do something different, 
it's always going to be on your own lens. So automatically, I think uh, it has like every time someone does a retelling, it's going to be different than any other retelling that's done before, because each of us has a different voice and each of us has like a different idea. And we've grown up with different experiences. And obviously all of that does reflect into writing. And I think like for mine, I just I wanted to mash up like for Rimrose Girls, there's four main fairy tale retellings. And that's like the four main ones. I technically have maybe 15 in total, like interwoven right there, like with, between all the pages. So that was one of the things that I wanted, like how do you try to control and try to meddle with all the stories and where they're going and at the same time not to feel like too overbearing and what you're trying to do but i think like with everyone as everyone said uh you just have to have fun with it it's it's the first role you have to be interest uh, interested in what you want from that trope and whether to just even though you're even when you're not trying to reinvent anything i do think everyone's doing something new with it either way i agree and if you give everyone here on this panel the same trope we're not going to write the same book even though it's the same trope and i'm sure some of you will add a lot of romance and others will be a little bit less romantic with your text so it's definitely a case-by-case -case type of situation so the first rule of fantasy club is have fun very good all right so writing secondary worlds can be fun for readers to escape in but daunting for authors to create What's the most challenging aspect about world building for you and how do you overcome it? We're going to start with Francesca again. Hello. So the hardest part <laughs> about world building for me is magic systems. They destroy me every time I write a book, <laughs> but I'm trying to make it easier on myself with each new book that I write. So I think they're so hard because you're trying to write something that's you're trying to describe something that's like inherently impossible, but you're trying to describe it in a way that's real. And you just run into lots of little things, like logical things that kind of break the suspense and make it seem like, you know, fake. And obviously it's fake, but you know. Um, so the way that I try to make my magic systems more real and have more logic to them and fit into the story is to think of pros and cons um, to using it. And I think that really helps flesh it out because there are pros to using it you'll see why the character wants to continue using it or if you know if they have a good reason for using it then the cons will show the difficulties in the plot that they face and that will help you kind of structure the whole story around it so yeah that's definitely the thing that's hardest for me but um thinking of the pros and cons of magic helps me write it in a way that feels more integrated to the story instead of just sort of slapped on but it's cool and magic is cool but <laughs> all those yes. logic And I think like, yes, go ahead. Come up and it just. Me, unless I really think about it. Agreed. And I think that also when you're thinking about what's, as you said, fake versus what feels real, it's interesting because a lot of people will catch on the things that feel fake and they will stop reading your book, even if it's like a beta reader or a friend. They're like, oh, this does not feel like it really would happen. And it's a magical spell. And you're like, oh, OK, why doesn't it work for you? So that's something I also struggle with. <laughs> Romina? Actually, it's funny. Uh, Francesca and I uh, hosted a webinar on world building for Las Musas before. And it was so fun because, you know, we all come at it so differently. It's amazing how many ways there are to world build. It's, you know, it's exhaustive. But I think for me, probably the thing I struggle with the most that anyone, you know, my critique partner or editor can tell you is I overcomplicate. Like from the first word, I'm overcomplicating it. And it's the first note I always get is too much, you know, just like, I can't read this, like go back, like try again, you know, like, I want to do everything so much. And like, I don't just want to give you a bathroom. I want to show you how this bathroom is different from the door. I want to show you how the, and it gets to the point where like, I can admit like, yes, it's too much. You know, it's like, if everything is going to be a novelty, then like you have like no rise rising and low, you know? And so I, that is my biggest thing. I, I, 
I don't know how to cut back and be like, okay, you don't like, you know, um, someone had mentioned reinventing the wheel, right? Like, it's like, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Like I, I struggle with it, you know, um, cause I, I just always go too big. It's the Virgo thing. I'm blaming, I'm blaming the stars here. That's it. That's all. Let us blame the stars all the time. <laughs> Same. Maya? <laughs> um, for me, it's definitely, first starting building a world is hard because it's overwhelming. I'm just sitting here like I'm a normal human. I cannot build worlds. Um, <laughs> I should not be trying. Um, but also at the beginning, I remember I was on a, I was on a, pa a panel with Zoraida Cordova and she was asking me about, um, <laughs> she's the best about world building. And I told her it took me a long time to be able to decolonize my brain. Um, when it came to writing this stuff, like, uh, Nocturna is based on, I'm half Dominican and I grew up doing um, summer trips to the DR as a child. And I never saw like a Caribbean island, darker skinned Latinos kind of world out there. So when I first started writing Nocturna, I would write like, this character is blonde and they like eating lamb stew and things that I've never eaten. <laughs> and it didn't make any sense. I went back like, no, why would they eat lamb stew if they could have sancocho? And why are they eating apples when they probably would be eating mangoes? And like, why? Like, I had to go back and rewrite because the default is Game of Thrones type of stuff. And that's exactly what my first draft came out as, like Game of Thrones with a couple of couple more brown people in it. Um, so I had to go back and really look at look at all those places where I went to the default and also ask myself, why not when I changed it? Um, an example, and I know a bunch of people on Goodreads, when I used to live at Goodreads, I don't anymore. But <laughs> yeah, I know, it was not smart. Stay um, away from Goodreads. <laughs> I'm trying. But people were, <laughs> some people were like, it was really cool that uh, Finn, the thief, is walking through uh, the kingdom and she there's like a band of people playing bachata music on their guitars and like that's not something i would ever see like in game of thrones there'd be a bard with like a what are those <laughs> <laughs> what are those a i don't guitar? even know like no, instruments a a let's just call them instruments yeah <laughs> and they'd be singing some sort of like very british very european type of thing and i was like well this is a dominican world and people are playing bachata in the street and people are dancing um, yeah. so asking myself, like, why not, why not put bachata in the streets? Why, why not? Um, that's, that's the hardest part is giving myself permission to ask why not pretty much. I absolutely agree. And I don't know if it's the case, speaking of Goodreads, I don't know if it's the case where you intentionally add something that is so popularized. Like for example, in my case, dragons and people are used to European dragons, the wyvern, the fire drake, which of course I mentioned in this, in these two books, but. Mm -hmm. What does a Caribbean dragon look like? A Puerto Rican dragon specifically? Yeah. Like, we don't see those. So I completely yeah. understand. It's like, we should be dancing bachata in the streets and we should be flying Puerto Rican dragons. Exactly. <laughs> Aiden? Um, my biggest problem with world buildings that I won't stop talking. Um, I have a very, like, visual we brain. We can confirm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, when I'm writing a book, it's biggest job is translating what I'm imagining and putting it down into words and especially when I get really excited like right now I'm working on a second world fantasy that's uh, inspired by Mexico and so it's like I want to tell you everything and here's all the little details of the city and I'm gonna tell you what the food is like what the smells are like and the sights and my poor poor sweet editor is like Aiden this is so much you have to cut it down and I'm like well I don't know how to do that because it's like I want I really want to ground my reader in this world and in this culture and um I say this a lot but I I always want to show off like the Mexican culture and like how beautiful it is specifically and it's like well how am I supposed to do that if I can't have 10 pages describing what this one city look block looks like um so that's always the hardest part for me and it's um and it's kind of a good problem to have because it's like it gets long because I'm so excited to talk about it <laughs> so that part is nice <laughs> um but at the same time, it's like, okay, I need to be more economical about it, I guess. <laughs> and that's the real struggle. Yeah, because you're kind of falling in love with your worlds. So you have to know it in and out. But sometimes as you draft, it kind of gets better for you to know what stays and what should not. Laura, what do you struggle with? 
Um, I used to struggle with, like, I used to, I'm going to be like, wow, mind blowing. No, that's a lie. But uh, I think when Maya talked about decolonizing our brains, one of the things that I used to struggle a lot was just trying to explain everything all the time. And it's one of, like, it's, it's very ingenuously like American thing. Like I used to read a lot of American fantasy of like American authors and mostly white. And uh, there are just so many rules all the time. Like, uh, you know, if a dragon flies, there has to be a reason for you flying or, you know, every little thing has to have a rule. And I don't think that works in fantasy. And I don't think rules are that interesting. And I'm sorry, Romina, am I offending you as a Virgo? <laughs> I, but, I'm so offended. <laughs> I love what you're saying. Yeah, but I, I think like we can explore so much more when we're not just not grounded by the idea that we have to explain everything. And obviously, also like Goodreads will like, in fact tell you like, oh, I mean, they didn't explain this food or how does this grow and everything. And to me, um, what is wild is that we as people, we don't understand every aspect of the world we live in. I mean, can you imagine if every time you had to go to the bathroom, you were like, how does the, like, the sewer work on this building? How am I gonna, like, how was money made all the time? Like, how's the stock market today? How am I gonna explain? I don't know. <sighs> I mean, I was gonna say NFTs. If anyone understands <laughs> how NFT works, I mean- Please explain to the panel. That is definitely like a plot hole in our universe. That is and, a plot you know, hole in our universe. Exactly. I love and I, that. And I, I just think that it's it's wild to ask authors to just have um, all the answers all the time. So I think the important thing, coming back to like the first question that we answered, is just that we have fun and we can have like focus on the things that we do find interesting. And world building, when we talk about it, it's very daunting. But I think. I think it is daunting because we're so set by Western rules and like European rules because we're just following along those lines and uh, they said that rules are important and they have to be this way and fantasy has to be that way. When I think they can just, you know, to put it nicely, go live in the moon or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think we should just um, follow all the rules all the time because rules are not interesting and everyone who <laughs> follows the rules are not going to be groundbreaking and you're not going to present anything that can be new and unique if you keep following like what came before you. That's, I could not have said it better myself. It's the copy pasting of it all that kind of, you know, permeates but also bothers personally. And speaking of being authentic and being unique, do you think that even though we are having fun and we are enjoying what we do and trying to present new versions of older tropes and older stories to audiences, do you think there is a greater expectation for authors of color to not only create convincing secondary worlds, but also to teach non-BIPOC readers about their specific identities? Francesca, you can start. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Well, <laughs> um, as a Latino author, the biggest pressure that I feel is that if my books don't do how that will affect other writing, I try to just write my specific experience because I think this is going to be different to everyone. So I try to just write that. And I hope that anyone who reads it will try, will be able to find something to connect to, even if that's not an identity thing that they can um, just find, find something to connect to, to keep reading. Because I often see a lot of readers who will avoid reading books just because they don't match the identity of the characters, whether that's uh, race or ethnicity. Spirituality, anything they just want an important tool to foster empathy and to just have your own challenged so I or connect with them in my book. Yes. Romina, would you like to answer? Um, I I mean the most I could probably speak to this that I've experienced with always Sona again is language. Like I've yeah. like just like as someone as like a 
Spanish speaker. Like I've just been like, there's a lot of people who don't want to have to Google phrases, you know, um, and who don't want to have to use contextual clues, which is like the first thing we're taught for reading. Um, and, and who just don't want to be out of their comfort zone. And to them, I always say the same thing. Well, imagine being an immigrant who everything is out of your comfort zone. Everything needs translating, everything. And then think about the fact that maybe I want you to feel a little bit of that to help you understand the position Manu is in. But you're in good hands. You're in an author's hands. They're not going to let you down. People out in the real world don't have that safety net, you know? Um, so I think that's probably the closest I've experienced uh, a challenge. In that sense. I agree. And, but they will read and listen to and like interact with high Valerian, whatever that is. And that's fine. But Spanish, oh my God, it's so hard. Um, Maya, would you like to answer? And this would be, since we are nearing the 15 minute mark, we're going to get into some student questions, which I'm really excited about. But Maya, yes, you have the floor. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I will say basically, but, <laughs> okay, this is a this is a big question, and the Latino yes. community's relationship with race is really, really, really complicated. Um, I remember the day that I realized that Shakira was Latina, but we weren't the same race. <laughs> Brain yeah. explosion. Um, and so there's an extra, there's an added barrier because everybody here is Latino, and we have that linguistic barrier. I had someone send me a message on my site being like. This Latin curse word you use, I don't think it sounds right. I don't like it. <laughs> and I was oh like, my gosh. I'll tell you, sis, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's the language. Um, so there's, there's that barrier first, which we all experience on this panel. And then there's right. this secondary barrier where, like, I'm writing Afro Latino characters, I'm writing brown characters and black characters. And I have people within my own community telling me, Are you really Latino? Because you're darker skinned. Um, yeah. Are you. <laughs> Like, does this represent real Latinidad? Is Dominican Republic and the Spanish y'all speak, is that real Latinidad? So there's this entire extra layer about whether I count and and the idea of representation in general, because like, I remember how excited I was when Shakira and JLo did the Super Bowl. And then I felt sad because I realized like, they only picked white Latinos to do this, you know? like. When it comes to which books get chosen and which Latinos get to represent us on a global scale, on global scale, on an international stage, Latinos of color are left out most of the time. And the darker the darker skin you are, the less likely that you're going to have a voice or be able to represent. And we've all seen that in like telenovelas and every form of Latino media we have, where everybody is is pretty much white. Yeah. Um, so it's it's like there's the layer, the linguistic layer, the cultural layer of being Latino, and then there's the layer. Of I'm Latino and I'm black, <laughs> and it just creates a lot of complications. And we are expected to cater, since white is the default, which is like a, a white is the default. So if you're writing like about like Argentina, where the culture and the community is mostly white, people are going to be jerks about it still because it's in Spanish. But they're going to see and be like, well, this person still kind of looks like me, and I can kind of like assume. Like I can take this this persona on, I can like connect to this person. But if it's like they speak a different language and they're black or brown, all of a sudden it's like, I don't know. I don't know right. if I can read this. I don't know if I connect to this. Um, so it's, it's very, very difficult. And every time any of us try to write, um, we're trying to crack the door open a little bit more so that the next people behind us don't have as much of a hard time. Like it makes me, it makes me sad that I'm one of the few when it comes to like Afro Latino fantasy. I don't know if I'm the only right now. When Nocturna came out, I was, um, but there's just such a clear preference for a certain type of Latino, um, a, like white Latinos over everybody else. And it is a hard world to work in, but we out here and we're gonna keep pushing and we're gonna keep making space and and pulling up seats to the table, whether people like it or not. So, so yeah, we out here. <laughs> Sorry, that was a long response. But... That was the only response. Yeah, <laughs> I like I like the fact that we are facing these types of questions from readers and from the industry itself. Yeah. And we have to answer everything. We are expected to know the answers to everything. And if we don't, then we're the failures. Yeah. And not, and we are the problem if we ask yeah. the questions. So, I would like to thank everyone for your thoughts on that matter. And if I'm not mistaken, we have some student questions. Okay, so 
So the first question comes from Dali A, ninth grade, California. Here we go. What was your family's relationship to books when you were a child? Aiden, you can answer this one first. Oh my God, I love these videos. Um, <laughs> so when I was younger, uh, like you mentioned, I was born and raised in Oakland, California. Um, my family was very poor growing up. And my mom read a lot of books and kind of what my daycare was, was getting dropped off at the public library. And so I like live there for a while. <laughs> and um, so my mom was a big reader. I was an incredibly reluctant reader. I would buy, she would make me like take books home. And so I would get like Animorphs because if you did the little flippy thing, the image would change. And that was something I could stare at for 15 minutes and pretend I read. And then um it wasn't until I was in like sixth grade, I think, that I actually read a complete book and it was Hell's Moving Castle by Dan Wynne Jones. And I would just like fell madly in love. I was like, because I was just having all the wrong books pushed on me. And so to finally have fantasy in my world um, was life changing and amazing. And it made me excited about reading. Um, and then I consumed books like, you know, they were cookies. <laughs> um, so yeah, my mom tried very hard for a very long time and eventually she got it. <laughs> Just takes trial and error, but we got there, we got there. Laura, you can go ahead. Um, my family always loved reading, like my parents loved reading, my grandparents loved reading. So I had a pretty easy time finding myself like a reader. And so um, like my grandma, when she passed away, she gave me some of her library as well, just because, you know, books are always in the family. So I have like these really ancient editions of like Jules Verne, which were one of my favorites. I was like the only grandchild who read all of Jules Verne's collection, um, which means obviously I am a fantasy and sci-fi writer. So I was like, oh, this guy's like on a submarine. That's cool. Like, yes. So I was um, seven years old and reading everything without really understanding all of it but um my parents always uh, were very encouraging towards reading and writing like um when my sister and i couldn't read we uh, my parents just sat down with us like every single night and they read us a story maybe like a fairy tale or a chapter from whichever book we were reading so all the time they were very encouraging and now to the point that i have like a lot of books and all my parents and my both my parents are like maybe we shouldn't have encouraged so much because now we have way too many all the time like how come this keep like more books keep coming up in our house so yeah <laughs> there's no such thing as too many books yeah, Ever. my mom. Yeah, my mom is like at the point where she's like, "No, this is this is enough." <laughs> yes. So I believe Laura, can you introduce the book again? Yeah. Um, you can do that. My book is um, the Green Rose Girls. It is um, like a mashup between a thriller and fantasy, and set in a boarding school in Switzerland. And it's about four girls who find themselves tied with their destinies tied to like a fairy tale curse. And if they don't find how to break it, they are going to succumb to it just like their friend who died mysteriously at the beginning of the year. So it has lots of fairy tale retellings. It is very queer and um, it is in paperback. So it's very floppy and very cheap. So you should get it. <laughs> I love that very cheap all right let's do a lightning round for the last two final questions student questions this one is from justin c hi my name is justin and my question is how do you stay focused and decide whether or not your book is good enough who wants to have at that one i can get so when I get overwhelmed when I'm writing or revising something, that's when I know it's time for me to take a break or send it to someone else to get feedback on it because otherwise I'm just going to keep making it worse. So yeah, when I get overwhelmed is when I stop. <laughs> it's a good rule of thumb. If you're overwhelmed to go do something else. All right. So for the final question, we only have text, no video. So let's look at it right now. What was the hardest thing about your journey to becoming a published author by Gaudiana J from sixth grade? 
rejection. Oh, <laughs> that was a very loud response, Romina. I'm sorry. You felt that. You felt that. <laughs> my, heart, my heart broke when I read that rejection. I have to say it took me about eight and a half years and five manuscripts, you know, and the sixth one I finally got a contract for. Um, and I just remember all the rejections, all the rejections and just feeling so overwhelmed. So I would say if you feel also crushed and defeated by rejection, do not give up because if I hadn't written the sixth book, I wouldn't be talking here. So just keep writing, just keep writing. You have to believe in yourself. And it's also very important to say how long your process was and how difficult your journey was, if it was difficult, because we're used to seeing all of these overnight sensation type of stories. And those are of course valid, but not common. So. So does anyone else want to tell Gabriela what was the hardest thing about your journey to becoming a published author? Other than rejection, of course. I think all the waiting, like waiting yes. around to see what anyone says about anything that if anyone's interested. And for me, as someone with ADHD who also really revels in um, instant gratification, it's a huge deterring factor because I'm just like, yeah. well, what the heck? It's been a week. And I don't know anything yet. It's awful. Uh, so that's really hard and kind of just like, uh, just like Romino was, was saying, just like pushing, even though like keep going, even though you sometimes you're getting a bunch of rejections and it's taking forever. You just have to, you have to outlast it. Yeah. And I believe we're all, do we all consider ourselves introverted? Slightly. And yes. All right, so it's, for me, it would be building community, finding people who are like-minded in the industry who really want you to succeed because sometimes be, people will be very supportive and other times it's difficult to know if certain people are really supportive or they're just, you know, there. <laughs> so yes, thank you so much for your student questions. We love answering them and hearing from you personally. I think Aiden is a huge fan of the videos Yes. <laughs> that would conclude our panel, I believe. So thank you so much for attending the Add a Little Bit of Magic panel at the Latinx Kit Lid Book Festival. We wish you a lovely rest of your day. And always remember to stay awesome. Bye, everyone. And thank you to our co-panelists today. It was a pleasure, as usual. And I love you all. <laughs> thank love you so all. much. <laughs> I hope you stay and watch. <laughs>